All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Cantley. I serve as Dean of Students here at the University of Delaware. Thank you for watching another one of our videos geared towards parents and families and helping them find connection here to the university. Um, today, I'm joined by Dr. Brad Walgas from the Counseling Center. Brad, if you want to introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure. Thanks, Adam. I am Brad Walgast. I'm a psychologist and the director of the Counseling Centers, the Center for Counseling and Student Development at the University of Delaware. It's my 13th year here at the university and it's my 20th year in college mental health. So I'm excited to be here to give a little background and perspective on what we do and what we offer. Great. So today we'll be talking about our Counseling Center, mental health on campus. As always, this will be posted on social media, so if you have a question, you can put it in the comments below the video, and someone from the university will gladly respond to those and help you connect to more information. We'll also use that to put information about how to connect to resources on campus, such as the Counseling Center. Mm -hmm. um, so let's kick it off with the first question, uh, I think a good one. Um, mental health seems to be a really big topic on college campuses. It seems yeah. to be something that has really started to grow in terms of concern on college campuses. What are your thoughts on that? Why do you think that is? It's, uh, it's a question I get a lot, and I think there's two really different answers to the question that are they feed on one another. One of them is there's been a huge growth in the requests for services from counseling centers across the country, especially over the last five to 10 years. Um, and why that is, there's plenty of people who are trying to figure that out. I have some ideas. But what we have noticed in the last 10 years since I've been here, our rate of uh, students requesting emergency services has increased 169%. Mm -hmm. So we've changed the way we practice uh, to, in order to accommodate students. One of our main priorities is to be able to meet students when they're having an emergency um, and do what we can to get them connected to services if our offices are closed. I can tell you more about that in a minute. Um, but the changes in young adults in the last several years probably has something to do with social media, with having phones and laptops and accessibility to the internet at all times, and less time spent with friends and spending face-to-face, -face, sure. um, so that the comfort around some of the social things that happen for any college student, especially their first year, feel a lot more intense and a lot more uh, intimidating than they might have to a student who was entering college 20 years ago, 30 years ago or more. Um, the other side of that, so I said there were two, the other side of that is one of the things that offices like ours have been doing, I just bumped my microphone, mm -hmm. so one of the things that offices like ours have been doing for decades has been encouraging students to consider the stigma against mental health as something that's not really helpful to them. So seeking services and seeking help and feeling comfortable talking about their mental health issues is something we've been asking people to do forever. And it's happening. So finally we're having students take us up on that and they're talking to advisors and they're talking to RAs and they're asking for help at times. So the good news is for us, Students are finding us, they're using our services, and they're feeling more comfortable talking about things that get better when, with more conversation. Um, the other side of that is um, sometimes RAs and professors don't know what to do when they are sure. being presented with mm -hmm. the new sort of mental health sorts of information. And so we are working as a, as a center to sort of engage the faculty and the staff around how do you find us? How do you find the best resources for the student that's sitting in front of you? Because you're not a therapist and you're, this is not why you're here. You can be helpful, but let's help you get them to the next best place for help. Yeah, and I think for a lot of our students, would you agree, coming to college for some of them is the most significant life transition they have ever faced, Certainly, right? Yeah. So a lot of times these pop up mental health concerns pop up around times of transition, right? Absolutely, and, and the biggest first transition is probably, I think it's 70% of students coming to college these days have never shared a room, right? Mm -hmm. And you come to college today and you're most likely sharing a room with at least one person. So there may be more than that, and you probably don't have your own bathroom. That's something all by itself that on its face seems like, yeah, it's not such a big deal, but week three, week seven, week 10 of that, and living that lifestyle can be a little bit overwhelming. And if you add a little bit overwhelming 
living situation to some hard classes and a complicated relationship here or there or something comes up, then you can wind up with enough stress that it's really helpful to talk to somebody about. So when our students are looking for support, what are some common places that they go to or how they find help on our campus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is that's a great question. It follows right from the last one of <clears throat> since so many students are more comfortable talking about their concerns and sometimes mental health concerns, we're having more requests. And, and what we've found when we ask students um, is that the first people they talk to are their friends, maybe a roommate, um, and then probably a parent, so people watching this video. And then they may talk to an RA or somebody else on campus, and then down the list is a counseling center kind of staff member. And what I want parents to know, first of all, is that they didn't forget. They still know your number, and they will still <laughs> call you and use you to help them deal with a complicated situation. Um, not every student who's dealing with a difficult time needs a counseling center, and we rely on parents and staff and faculty to know when that line has been crossed. They're like, well, this seems like more than just a casual or complicated conversation. It seems like someone who needs a little, who has more training or ability needs to handle this. Okay. We rely on parents for that, and we are accessible to parents who aren't sure if it crosses that line or not. You can call us, you can ask to speak with somebody who's on our staff and say, yeah, here's what I just heard. And, and maybe it's not about your student, but maybe it's about your student's roommate and how they're dealing with their student's roommate's mental health issues. We can be helpful in helping the parent figure out what to do next as well. So students are going to go all kinds of different directions to ask for help and to talk about what's going on. <clears throat> and in the past, they would usually either come to us or maybe have a private conversation with an RA. What we're finding now is they'll talk to a lot of different people, which is great. And from a mental health perspective, the more comfortable you feel talking with people about what's going on, the more likely you're going to find help. Yeah, and I think that's good that a lot of, you know, our first year seminar courses are adding conversations just generally about um, the different services and ways to access help on campus so mm -hmm. that if a friend is going to another friend, they at least have some base knowledge of, of what can be helpful on right. our campus. Right. So when we think about um, trends in mental health and what you all are seeing in the Counseling Center, maybe you could share some of the, the, the recent data and trends that have been kind of popping up in your field that are being discussed. Sure. Um, probably related to uh, the, the increases in social media and the contact that people have mostly through their thumbs rather than <laughs> through their eyeballs <coughs> is social anxiety. So mm -hmm. students arriving on campus feeling concerned, worried, upset about what I think people are thinking of me or whether or not I should be there or doing that and that has increased dramatically in the last 10 years. Prior to that point it was really easy to say the number one people use number one reason people use our services is feeling down or depressed. That has flip-flopped with feeling stressed or anxious to and the depression didn't change, that's still right where it was, but anxiety and stress has risen to a mm -hmm. higher level than it's ever been for what people are walking in our door with. So that's clearly the number one increase. Um, another thing we've noticed a trend in, <clears throat> and all of these things I'm saying are not University of Delaware trends, they're United States of America trends for young adults. The other trend we're noticing is more Probably it's more comfort in acknowledging or admitting feeling uh, thoughts about death and thoughts about wanting to hurt yourself. Um, previously, 15, 20 years ago, that was less common or less commonly disclosed. And now we're hearing that much more commonly disclosed and much more, um, I was going to say casual. I don't think anyone's casual about mentioning it, but it's a lot easier of a conversation right. than it used to be. Um, and I think those are, those are tough things to hear for the first time. Folks like you and I have training of um, when somebody presents to us and maybe they are talking about self-harm or presenting concerns around suicidality and things like that. Um, but for some people who have never heard that before, mm. you know, we're doing trainings on campus and talking to a lot of different folks about how to respond in those situations. But 
if a family member would have concerns maybe about their, their student, of course, they're far away from that student, yeah, they're not right. here on campus. Right. What would you say to them if they had concerns about you know, their student potentially hurting themselves or things like that? Sure. And this is something we've started talking about more even from new, or, new student orientation and beyond because it's become more of a, more of a common issue for us. The, the first thing to know is you don't want to hold on to that by yourself and just try and figure it out on your own. If you're worried, share the, share the worry and so we, we always say, you know, widen the circle, add somebody into the group so that you have support. Um, and for us, if we're open and our hours are, you know, eight to five every day, give us a call. We'll talk you through what's going on and we'll find the next best step. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. If we're closed between 5 p.m. and 8 in the morning, we have a 24-hour number called the helpline. It's 302-831-1001. That's our helpline. It's staffed by licensed clinicians who are available 24 hours a day. Um, you're not waking them up. If you call them at 2 in the morning, they're, they're there and that's their job. And those calls get also, uh, we get information from those calls routed to our office, so there's always follow-up um, from our end when there needs to be with the student. So those counselors, as well as our staff counselors, can provide consultation with any parent anytime to help discuss what's the ne best next step. If it's emergent and there's significant concern, you can call straight to the University of Delaware Police Department um, and they will help locate your student and work to make sure that they're safe. Um, the Office of the Dean of Students is also another great touch point for, for handling these kind of situations. So I think that's really, really hard for people when somebody is in that place where you have an imminent concern for their health and safety, but really, you know, on our campus, um, police are the best resource, you know, um, mm -hmm. either dialing 911 directly from your home line and they'll get you connected here or right. the police at 302-831-2222, that's our direct police line. Mm -hmm. um, but our police officers are trained to assess, de-escalate situations, get quick connection to mental health support in those right. situations. And really, if we're talking about we need to respond quickly, they are the best resource to respond in that, that immediate space. And then folks like yeah. me and you and our teams will be on the back end to help with care and transition right. and things like that. Right. Yeah, and we work with the University of Delaware Police Department with some frequency and we have really good interactions with them and they're well trained and they're very good at managing and working with our students um, in a way that doesn't feel like a TV show. It feels very, you know, genuine and caring. Right, they, they're trying to get help for that person. I think that's one I appreciate about our department. Yeah. They talk about how they're here for care and safety and the education of folks. So it's definitely something that I know they value and they yeah. train on as well. Right. I think another concern that, that people have in terms of maybe accessing or engaging services is this idea of confidentiality. Mm. If I come to the counseling center or my student comes to the counseling center, all of their faculty are gonna know about it, right. things like that. So can you speak a little bit to the confidentiality of your services? Sure, here? absolutely. And this is something uh, I think that unfortunately keeps some students away for exactly the reason that you're saying. What we love to tell students to be clear is that our work and our roles as a counseling center operate the same as they would if you were seeing someone privately. So we still have to adhere to our ethics and legal standards for our profession. So this profession of psychology says, what happens during that relationship with you and your client stays between you and your client. We have records, we have all kinds of information, but it stays confidential between us and our client. And the only way that that information gets shared is with a signed document by the student saying, I approve you sharing this information with this person or this entity. Otherwise, we're not allowed to provide information. It's not part of your educational record. It's a separate record that's um, by itself. No professor sees that, no administrator sees that, no staff member sees that, unless the student themselves signs a document saying, please do share this. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, I've worked with a couple of students that have been to the counseling center 
and they've come in and they're like, well, I assume you can see everything. And I was like, actually, I can no. see nothing. Right. I also think for our parents and families, sometimes that is a, mm -hmm. a sticking point for them mm -hmm. because their student also has to release that ability for you all to talk to families as well. And That's right. They may call you and say, hey, can I see what's going on with my student and get access to it if they visited you? And you can't provide that without that student's permission. Correct? Right. That's correct. At the same time, frequently we'll have students say, you know, I know my mom wants to talk to you, so I'm going to just, let me just sign this form and give you permission to talk to her. Um, that's totally normal. So if you have a student that you want to come see us, let them know, and you want to find out, like, mm -hmm. did they show up or are they, are they okay? Let your student know before they come in or after that there's a form, we call it a release of information, that they can sign to give us permission to talk to them. And it's, it's no big deal. That's totally fine. Some and we, students also have the right to say, nope, I don't want to do that. That's protected in their confidentiality. And if that's the case, we're going to ask the student to talk to you as the parent, not you. <laughs> and if the parent's calling us, we're going to say, you know, keep talking to your student. Maybe there's a way we can work this. Yeah, I think it's a tough one for, for people to grasp, but it also helps hopefully eliminate some barriers for people exactly. to come in. Because if they feel like, oh my gosh, you're going to tell my mom and dad or everything, you're going to tell um, my professor, admitted, my professor's yeah. everything. Yeah. Knowing that that isn't happening can sometimes reduce the barrier of getting connected to help. And that's the whole point. I mean, the whole goal of confidentiality is to create a safe place for any client um, to tell whatever they need to tell to mm -hmm. that clinician um, so that we can do the best work we can and to provide them with the best care we can provide. Right. I also think um, there is always this conversation around just college counseling centers, like you only get X mm -hmm. amount of visits mm -hmm. and they referred me to someplace else off campus. Can you maybe give a base explanation of the services, sure. um, what are the limitations around that and the referral process as well? Sure. Big question. It's huge, yes. <laughs> so I'll sit back. Guide me back if you need to. <laughs> yeah. um, college counseling centers across the country these days almost all of them have a session limit for the number of times a, a student can use services, either during the course of the year or during the course of their four year at the, at the university. The University of Delaware, we have a 12 session limit per academic year. Now a 12 session limit doesn't mean you're entitled to 12 sessions, it means up to 12. And in the meantime, you and your clinician are gonna decide what seems like the best use of our time together. Some students walk in the door for their very first meeting and they explain pieces of their lives or pieces of their experience where starting in a short-term treatment model doesn't really make sense. For instance, we'll have students who arrive saying, you know, I've been in therapy for the last three years. It's really good for me. I need it every week and I want something like that. That's not short-term therapy. That's not a good fit. We're going to help them um, find someone nearby where they can use their health insurance and a copay that they can do something like that in an ongoing way. Um, most of our referrals we see we refer about 15 to 20 percent of the students who walk in our door. Um, most of those referral folks are seen by us two, three, and sometimes four times. The average number of times we see someone who isn't referred out is about four times. So people who get referred are getting a kind of case management to help them get connected outside of our offices in a way that's important to us and helps make sure that that student is grounded and ready to go to the next step. Students who are seeing us average about four sessions, which by the way is the national average for outpatient psychotherapy, because that's about as much as, as people feel like they need at the time, whether that's the clinician and the, usually it's the clinician and the client deciding together this is about right. Um, the 12 session limit that we have at the University of Delaware when I started years and years ago was right about in the middle of what college counseling centers offered but looking around now and, and with the people I know in the field we're on the higher end. Most schools these days have more like a six to eight session model some very large schools have a model where they see students two times or less, which we call crisis work. Um, so there's a lot of variability. We're on the higher end, so we feel mm -hmm. pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it pleases everyone. Right. So we understand that too. We're serving 
20 plus thousand students who could potentially all be our clients. Um, we see somewhere between 10 and 11 percent of them every year. So in order to manage the number of students walking in our door and to be available for crisis situations, we have to limit the number of, of sessions that we offer to students who we are going to be seeing. Yeah, and I think that's uh, the referral point. You know, one thing I know that your staff has done is really invested in having a yeah. staff member that is dedicated now to helping students connect, mm -hmm. working, looking at their insurance, mm -hmm. looking at what they kind of want, what's available, even transportation-wise for them, right. to find them a really good referral when that mm -hmm. has to happen. So yeah. I know that's something we've invested in as well. Absolutely, and we're really pleased with our referral coordinator who, when she started and got this list of who was available, if it said walking distance, she would leave the office and walk to their office and say, yes, that's walking distance, or no, maybe not. And others who were a little bit further away, she found bus routes to get there. She found out about how much it would cost to take an Uber to get there. So she's really dedicated. She's really passionate. Students really connect with her because she's really, she's just a nice person. And right. she really likes helping people get to the next place. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then I know you guys also, the staff also does group work and, and mm. things like that. Could you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about maybe some of the groups that you offer that people could connect with? Too? Absolutely. Our groups program is really robust and it's one of the reasons in, in my field people want to come train with us because they learn how to do a lot of the groups that are really useful with college students. So first of all, um, the uh, secret in uh, college counseling is that between individual therapy and group therapy, one is far more effective than the other, and it's group therapy. Group therapy does um, all the outcome measures is more effective with college students than individual work. Wow. So we lean into that and let students know that that's something that is probably going to be more helpful to them than just working with one person. Mm -hmm. And going back to, remember, social anxiety is one of the big reasons people walk in our doors group is the best way to engage social anxiety. You learn, oh, maybe it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. Anyway, getting back to your question, um, we have a couple of groups that are really popular and really effective. We have several other groups that are also effective, but just less popular. We really lean into one called You've Got This, which was designed initially to work for incoming students, freshmen, transfer students around feeling overwhelmed, feeling like my emotions are too much and I don't know how to handle them and figuring out how to handle complicated relationship situations. The kind of thing every college student has to deal with sometimes often but at least once a semester. It's a four week program, it's an hour and a half each week. Um, we ran it the first time once in one semester and it filled, it went great. Second time we did it, second semester we ran it twice. We're up to now running it about six or seven times per semester because it's always filling and we always get good feedback from students. Um, it's a structured group, meaning it doesn't look like groups in the movies. It's really sort of a training session. Mm -hmm. We teach you things, you go home, you practice, and you come back the next week, talk about how it went, and learn something new. Um, students really like that mod modality. Um, so that's a really popular one. We have others that focus on sort of all kinds of anxiety called chillax that's really popular as well and it's sort of heavier in the training session mode. Um, it's not a group like in the movies. Um, and we also have several process groups which are a little bit more like the ones in the movies um, that are designed for different groups. So we have a grad student group that's focused on you know learning how to be better at being yourself with other people. Um, we have a group for body image, we have groups for grief, we have groups for undergraduate women, and so on and so on. And those change a little bit every semester, but we have a pretty stable, consistent group of groups that we offer to students. Great. Yeah. So if you were thinking about um, maybe your like pro level to we talk about these sometimes mm -hmm. a new student orientation, but right. what do you think parents can do to really have a good conversation with their student mm -hmm. about this parent and families mm -hmm. or uh, those supporting students on our campus? What, yeah. What's kind of your big tip for them thinking about how to help students in navigating mental health while in college? I think um, so a lot of things come to mind. One of the things I really encourage parents to do with their with their students is to 
be thoughtful about how they talk about mental health with their students and to encourage or even reference people who are treating their mental health effectively um, with you know appreciation you know whether it's a whether it's a star who's tweeting about you know I'm, I'm going back to rehab or I'm gonna go see my therapist again not mocking that not sort of saying oh that's whatever but saying hey look somebody they're taking care of themselves it's a for some families that's a real shift and students while they may feel good about it will follow some of those leads that they hear from their families if if their family seems to think that treatment or therapy or whatever is not a good idea they may be more reluctant to go um, so just thinking about how you talk about and how you reference especially when it's in the the media or in pop culture um, that people are taking care of their mental health that's a good thing and, and let it be a good thing and I have one more pro tip because you know I want to talk about sleep, sleep. yeah Brad's, that's me uh, that's Brad's specialty area is sleep <laughs> so if you want to learn about sleep we've got we've got the man right here to just hang us. around me long enough and you'll hear you something learn a lot. yeah because I can hardly stop talking about it um, for especially college students and especially in the first year or two if if you're going to recommend any one thing to your student not knowing any not, I don't know anything about them the one thing you can recommend to them is that they're getting maybe about another hour of sleep per night than they're already getting most college stu students these days are sleeping about six hours a night plus or minus and that's really not enough to sustain over the semester a high immune system and a high ability to do academic work you start strong and, and the longer you go at six-ish hours the more you fade and the easier it is to pick up colds and flus and the harder it is to store new information and manage things like your mental health sure awesome well brad thanks for taking time to be You're here welcome. with us if you want more information about the counseling center you can visit their website very easily udell.edu slash counseling you can also call them on their line 302-831-2141 and then our 24-hour helpline again as we have for after hour support is 302-831 1001. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below and we'll definitely address those as they pop up. And thank you all very much and thank you again, Brad. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, awesome. Thank you.